Thank you all for being here. Um, just going to start this off by admitting that um, I'm having a literal full-blown panic attack at the moment, which is always a fun way to start a, uh, a webinar. Um, I didn't really think that um, we, I thought it would be fine for, for folks to schedule this um, on a launch day um, because I thought that maybe this launch period was going to be about 48 hours long and instead it was like four hours long. Um, and so now we now we have the, um, the onslaught of people being very sad that um, we don't have enough pottery to sell. And so today we're going to be talking about that, um, why it also makes us very sad that we don't have enough pottery to sell and why that is and what we're doing about it. Um, that's going to be, I think, a lot of what we end up focusing on today. Um, but y'all have submitted some incredible questions. Alex, am I running to grab those from the printer before we forget? Um, and hopefully we're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can, but um, I, all three of us are um, are yappers, um, so we might uh, we might find ourselves um, going on and on. Um, but uh, on we go. My name is Connie Matisse. I am the CMO. I'm one of the co-founders here. Um, I'm married to Alex, who's the CEO. Um, I oversee um, the sales department, marketing department, customer care department, which will eventually be in the sales department and the creative department. Um, I also work with our people and culture team on our equity initiatives and um, uh, find myself in all sorts of other fun leads. Um, John, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is John Viglin, um, one of the founders as well. Coming on, um, I joined the team. Uh, Alex and I were just making pots together, but my role has evolved into overseeing the finances at East Fork. Um, so there was a big left turn there. Um, and yeah, so now I'm, I'm focused on finances and operations and trying to figure out how to do this thing with Alex and Connie. <laughs> and I'm Alex. Uh, I have the title of CEO. Um, I bought some land about 10 years ago and started a pottery called the East Fork, which is a very different thing than when I started. Um, shortly, well, basically before anything was even built, I had met Connie, uh, who was just kind of passing through town. And um, then John came out and joined us a few years later. And um, yeah, the, well, that's the story everybody, for the most part, already knows. Um, things that I oversee a lot of are production um, and kind of the innovation around production. So forming how we how we make the things, how we make more of the things. Um, I also do all of the investor relations um, for a lot of those investor relations. Um, although John actually prepares all of the um, stuff that we present. Um, what else do I do? I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. responding to frantic, frantic Slack messages, and I'm going to turn that over. Yeah. Here we are. You do a lot, though. You're overseeing the store project right now. Sure. Yeah, construction projects. Construction, like construction projects, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do a quick little um, uh, insight into what's currently on our minds um, in each of our in our departments, and um, then we're going to dive into into questions. So, um, I'll start it off. Um, it is um, always a wild time in the sales and marketing department. Um, really, since we started scaling this business, we have been struggling with this um, this funny conundrum of um, our demand greatly outpacing our supply. Um, we weren't really sure what that if that was going to be changed by um by covid and obviously in march and april when everyone was um curious to know what spending patterns were going to look like if people were going to be still interested in buying things like luxury pottery or you know fancy stoneware um we were questioning whether our um the demand for our product was going to wane um turns out it didn't um we moved to this pre-order model we'll definitely get into that um where basically we we open up a pre-order window and we take in as many um, orders as um, we can until we hit a threshold that production can maintain um, while, while also keeping within an eight week lead time. Um, which means that right now our pottery is only available for sale for um, 
uh, like two months of the two two days of the month. Um, so all the questions that have been asked about how COVID has affected our marketing strategy, um, it has completely turned it up side down. Um, in some ways it's made work a lot easier um, because production now has this beautiful list of things that they can, can respond to and um, they're actually being able to be much more efficient. Um, but it also, uh, yeah, every single, every single strategy that I thought I had like thoroughly vetted in my playbook um, had to get tossed out the window. So um, back in the learning curve, um, I'll stop there for the moment, pass on to you. Um, I've been thinking about how we make all the stuff that we need to make for the last um, six or so months. Uh, during COVID, our kind of long-term planning ground to a halt and everything focused on the present as it did for many businesses and people in general. Um, and now I've started to kind of look a little further out and um, especially seeing that demand is the same, our sales are strong. Um, although things are still, I think, pretty, uh, pretty up in the air and we're just on the front end of um, whatever is gonna happen over the next six to 12 months. Uh, right now, I'm looking at what the next steps are. Um, we're, we're currently uh, almost out of space in the building that we're in. So I'm looking at new, new buildings, new places to make things, new ways to make things, new equipment. Um, and we're talking about how we're going to fund all of that um, right now. So that's, that's where a lot of my focus is. We also have two large kilns um, currently. Uh, the bottleneck for us is the, the amount of kiln capacity that we have. Um, we have two kilns, well, two gas kilns that we can fire the glazed ware in, uh, and those are firing essentially seven days a week right now. Um, so we have new kilns. We ordered them uh, many months ago, and now they're stuck in Turkey. So I'm trying to figure out how to get them from Turkey to here. Um, and it's been quite a challenge. So that's sort of my, my immediate burning fire. Charter a helicopter. Well, I already have actually talked to UPS about doing a hot shot. Yeah. <laughs> what are you thinking about, John? Yeah, um, I think in, through the lens of, of finance, like Alex and Connie were saying, I mean, COVID obviously blew up a lot of plans for everyone on planet earth um but it certainly changed our our financial planning uh process here at east fork quite a bit um the uh, the added um i think right out of the gate when we first shut down there was a lot of um movements to figure out um what what could we do in the face of, of that shutdown um we were able to secure a pvp um loan through the CARES Act and that was a big deal for us to allow ourselves to to keep everyone on staff and to keep things kind of running relatively uninterrupted um, but then coming out of that we as Alex was kind of alluding to our longer term planning kind of fell off just because we were so focused on the present moment and we're now trying to get back into to looking down the road a ways to figure out um, how we can continue to be and to kind of thrive and grow and, and be the company we want to be given all the uncertainty of the present moment. And so whereas we usually just have one kind of financial plan for the year where we have a budget and revenue goals, um, given the uncertainty of the rest of this year, we went through this scenario planning process where we actually came up with four different potential plans depending on certain outcomes with, with coronavirus and certain financial outcomes internally. Um, so that's kind of ramped up the complexity of what we do, um, but has also felt um, yeah, really informative and it's it's great to see us kind of rising to the occasion as a group and um, that's where the kind of a financial aspect of things really are is just focusing on that scenario planning and, and risk analysis. Um, the other exciting stuff that I'm also trying to carve out more time for, uh, we're kind of right at the threshold of getting our B Corp certification, um, which maybe we could spend more time talking on, um, but that's uh, we're trying to push that across the finish line. So hopefully we're going to have a, an application in uh, next month on that. And kind of a subset of that that I'm also 
really excited about is um, building out a, a more comprehensive five-year carbon plan for East Fork with like a, a clear vision for us to, to work towards carbon neutrality. Um, so those are the kind of the two uh, side projects I'm, I'm dealing with on top of the other stuff, but yeah. That's I, think, I think you should dive in and, and, um, and spill the beans about our hopes and dreams for our carbon tax. Yeah, here, let me, uh... Oh, he's moving, he's on the move. There's just uh, some noise in the, the other room I wanted to close the door. Um, yeah, I mean, so the carbon plan is exciting. I feel like it's been in the works for a while, you know, ever since we got that gas cone, I think we've been having a discussion around how do we reconcile the kind of dependence on fossil fuels in our process of, of firing a, a kiln with natural gas. Um, and one, I think the B Corp certification process has really helped us evolve our thinking on that. But then an event last year that really leveled things up again was um, us kind of lucking into uh, a conference at Al Gore's family farm about climate change, in particular regenerative agriculture and soil science and carbon sequestration. Um, and Connie and I got to go out, out there for that. Um, that was a really inspiring event. And one of the results is um, we're trying to think through how we can build agriculture into our carbon plan, just because it touches on, it's kind of a, the theater upon which so much of what we do plays out. We make pots that you know hold food. Um, so that's starting to come together. Um, and I, it's also just, opening my mind to the, the ways in which you could kind of bring a lot of different kind of co-benefits into this plan, you know, make it broader than just carbon, but um, kind of build out a whole ecosystem of, of positive intent and, and outcomes. So that's feeling good. Yeah, that's a feel good project. Yeah. <laughs> um. I feel like we should just like dive into these questions because there's so many and they're all over the place. Um, when we're trying to think about how to structure this, um, the idea for this, this, the dish um, as we have uh, branded it is to do it um, once a quarter. Last year we, we had this idea to basically give um, uh, a similar report to our, our community stakeholders, our customers as we do to our investors. Um, so basically like walking through a slide presentation of that looks into our financials and looks into the hiring plans and um, just kind of gets in, in our marketing and sales strategy. Um, and I think that eventually we might still formalize this process a little bit, but um, instead of continuing to put it on the back burner, we thought we would just hop on here and, and more casually do like a quarterly check-in to, um, to see what sort of questions are floating around out there. Um, obviously we have set a very um, serious precedent to be um, radically transparent in a way that's um, not performative. Um, and what that it's like, it's, it's like once you start um, allowing access into um, the goings on of your business, it's like this, this whole like um, thing cracks open and then everyone wants to know more and more and more. But it's like, if you don't tell the whole story, like if you don't literally answer every single question there is to answer, it only feels more complicated. Um, so our goal in, in these little sessions is to, um, to start painting a more holistic picture um, into to how this thing works so that for folks who are um, interested in starting their own business or for folks who are just super curious, um, they, they have some answers that actually feel um, meaningful. Um, so let's just launch in. Um, this one was already, already kind of answered, but um, Wade, um, our, our friend at MailChimp, um, wrote in asking about what the most difficult part of the pandemic is in regards to our business and has our marketing strategy shifted at all? Um, and I, I'm curious to know from Alex and John, from your perspective, what you think the most difficult part of it is, because there's so many there's so many things that have been difficult, but it's also been like this period for us of like intense brainstorming and um, just idea generating and, and like plans for the future that I don't think would have happened outside of this. So like, what are, what are the obvious downsides? And we can talk about some of the fun stuff. Um, I mean, the obvious downsides for us was that we had to shut down the factory for um, how many weeks, John? Six weeks? It was at least partially shut down for, for two months full, yeah. Um, and so we lost a lot of production during that time. 
but the upsides of that was um, a lot of people really stepped up to the plate. So when we when we shut down or when we saw all this coming, um, we pre-sold a bunch of work. We put ourselves in a in a strong financial position, so we uh, through that could keep um, almost all of our staff on payroll um, and through the entire period. Um, and then folks would come in and work these skeleton shifts uh, when we did start scaling back in. But um, it was just a really, um, it was a really intense time. And we went to working two shifts, which we'd never done before, uh, which we're still doing now. So the first shift starts at 6.30 um, or six and goes to 2.30 and the second shift goes to 11. Um, so there was a lot of big changes that, that came with that. But um, through it, I think East Fork's emerging stronger and um, as, as of right now in a really good place, but we are kind of buffering for, for what the future holds. Um, so that's, that was production. Um, and yeah, Connie, if you want to speak to the, kind of the pre-order or the, how your life has changed with, with marketing. I mean, our office is shut down. So people are working from home as, as they are for most offices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've always been in the, the position of, um, of, my job has felt easy in some ways in that I've never been the person who's like not selling enough pottery. Um, and so the, the demand part that I haven't had to figure out how to continue selling the pots. Um, obviously there was, we had to make some serious shifts and, and the moving, the move to the pre-order um, felt really big, but it also was like immediately so effective that um, it wasn't a, cons a worry for me. The, the hardest parts, I guess, what is, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's just not seeing our team has been really the only that a lot of our teammates are working and my staff is working um, better from home than they um, do at the office. And that's been really interesting to see how much um, unnecessary work we were doing, how much how many unnecessary meetings we were having, um, how many unnecessary systems we'd spent a lot of time putting in place that once everyone went home, no one ended up using and the work still got done. Um, so for us, it's been um, it's been this kind of really um, special time of being able to take stock of what's actually important and to really um, to really double down and, and um, reprioritize um, the things that actually bring us joy and feel essential and feel really values aligned and has made it a lot easier to say no to the things that don't feel really exciting and necessary and um, and like it furthers our, our mission. So I, it, Obviously, the, the, the downsides are so obvious to this pandemic of, you know, being away from each other, people potentially getting sick, feeling scared for our teammates, worried about the future. But for, for the stuff that we, um, the, it, strangely, the, the good has, or not necessarily the good, but the, the way that, that I personally have been, like, filled with hope um, and for, a, for a better tomorrow, a new way of doing business um, uh, has been strengthened in this time. Um, and the marketing strategy, yeah, I mean, we don't, we, it, we're, we are over $80,000 under marketing budget for the year. Um, we have completely um, divested from Facebook and Instagram, Google advertising at digital ad spends. Um, we haven't spent it. Which we did long before. We did long that before. Became a thing to do. We did it before it was cool. Um, we, yeah, we made a decision last year to stop um, spending money with, with, on digital ads. Um, and that felt scary at first, um, especially since like, hopefully no one on Instagram, like at Instagram headquarters is listening because I still like really rely on that platform for web traffic. Um, uh, so don't shut us off. Um, but uh, that felt really good to make that decision and then to see how, um, to just be forced to get creative with how to, how to market our, our products in a way that just felt a lot better for us and so um we've been do the the small ads or the small budget marketing budget outside of salaries that we do have we've been um using um to pay really amazing um writers and artists and bartenders to come up with content that they can share on our platforms um that we feel really excited to share um never again do i want to like feel yucky about having to post some silly giveaway on the feed that I don't actually um, get excited about. And that, that feels really good to have some clarity into how we want um, to continue um, running our marketing and sales departments. 
Um, I think that that leads well into um, uh, Ray's question next, which is as a socially conscious business, how have your politics affected the bottom line and how did you make the decision to be so explicitly political? Um, I think that just to be really clear, the, the decision um, made itself and that um, we are, we are explicitly political humans as all humans existing uh, in this, you know, this, on this planet uh, are because everything we do is um, in relationship with these external forces that we're all interacting with every single day. And so trying to escape that and say that you can do business in a silo without recognizing the, um, the community uh, that you're doing business in and the impact that you're having on, um, on that community, um, it's, it's a lie, it's a farce to think that you can do business without being political, even if you're not doing it overtly. Um, so I think part of um, understanding your, your own complicity in um, systems that can be oppressive is acknowledging that you interact with them every single day. And so us running this business, us participating in capitalism in the way that we, at the scale that we're doing it and understanding that we're gonna not only keep participating in it, but like level up and, and um, participate it even more, um, we've, we've really realized that we have an opportunity to um, use this shared brain trust and um, to gather a big group of people to, um, to really dive in and figure out if there is a way to, um, to participate in this kind of intrinsically oppressive structure in a way that, um, that, that pushes against it and uh, paves a new path forward. Um, so yeah, we do it because it is, um, it's the right thing to do, I think. And um, we wanna, um, we want, we think that we have the ability to um, help prove to others that it's possible and that you can have a business, you can still pay people and pay people good wages and sell a product that you love and, um, and, and also, um, you know, acknowledge and, um, um, be proactive against um, the, the ways in which you are um, um, harming other people. So uh, yeah, that's why we do it. It's, it's affected the bottom line in that um, we have said no to a lot of growth opportunities and business opportunities that uh, probably would have been quite lucrative or um, just been very easy ways to acquire new customers. Uh, but the last thing we need to do right now is acquire customers in a way that feels yucky because we don't really, I, I want to be able to sat satisfy the customers that already exist. And I think only like 10% of people who wanted to buy Lapis today were able to. So we're lucky in that way in that we have built a business to a point where we can be um, really political. I've, I've, I think more needs to be um, spoken about how you don't have to, not every single person on this planet needs to be your customer. Um, it's up to, like, the business owner has a lot of opportunity to, um, to choose who they sell pottery to, um, not, by, not by saying I won't sell pottery to you, but by saying, hey, here's who we are and what we stand for and you're welcome to buy pots from us. And if you don't like that, then there are other places you can buy pottery and that's it. Um, and so that's translated for us to um, holding really um, hard lines when, when customers come on and start abusing our customer care team, um, treating them violently, treating them aggressively. Um, we know that, that there's another person um, who's gonna not treat our customer care team that way, um, who is going to be very happy to be able to purchase the pot. And uh, so we'll say, you know, this, this just isn't the right company for you. Um, we'll, we'll see you later. So we've done a, a great job of, I think, self-selecting our customer base. We make it very clear who we are, what we stand for. Um, and in that way, like once you kind of, once you kind of make that stance, you can't turn back. And then, and the more you, there's this positive feedback loop. And when other people say, "Hey, I see that. I see what you're doing, and I validate it, and I agree with it, and I, I want to, I want you to keep doing it," um, then you get encouraged. And so that's that's where we are right now. Is that we've seen it work. We have a proof of concept. Um, we we know that you can be a. Um, <laughs> oh my god! I literally just swallowed a freaking gnat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. It was really on a good. <laughs> anyway, that's why I hope that answered the question, Ray. And um, a large tumbler to be a thing. A twenty-two ounce tumbler is a really big tumbler. I feel like uh, <laughs> that's a gulp. that's a big gulp. But I think we can. John made one. Yeah. We can pull up a stein. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make one. We're gonna get one custom made for you for that great question. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> All right, next question. We're going to change gears a little bit, then we'll come back into, you know, these, we're, these kind of bounce around a little bit. Uh, 
this one we're going to answer in a two-parter. John's going to take the beginning and I'm going to take the end. So it is from Catherine. What was the process of coming up with that mug? It's seriously the most comfortable mug I've ever used. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, John, do you want to sort of start up, start us off? Yeah, happy to. Um, that's a good, like, where to begin sort of question. But um, to me, that the, the mug design and kind of the product design, broadly speaking, had its roots uh, in Alex and I's particular pottery training. So we both apprenticed in this kind of particular traditional lineage that was informed by the southeastern vernacular folk pottery kind of going back to when Europeans first colonized um, the US and then also roots to go back uh, to Europe and in, in Asia as well. Um, but there was this kind of like mm, dogma about you know how how one should make pots you know kind of according to arts and crafts principles and like you know generations of, of people kind of thinking and talking about this stuff that Alex and I kind of got fully uh, brainwashed with to some extent <laughs> doing our apprenticeship uh, it's kind of it's a really beautiful tradition and I mean I could talk for for a long time on on that whole process but uh, I think what's started to change is that Alex and I were really in love with those pots but also recognizing that um, it was in some regards very like insular and self-referential like uh, there were this kind of core group of people making those pots and a core group of people who were the audience for those pots. And it was kind of specialists and enthusiasts on both sides of things. It wasn't very broad, uh, the appeal or kind of the awareness of it. Um, and Alex and I actually, when we were first talking about working together, we wrote handwritten letters back and forth <laughs> about our vision for, you know, what, what we could do um, with those pots and, and what sort of audience we're going after. And I think, um, back then and, and it kind of holds true now, what I felt was that that work really could, uh, a lot more people could get excited by that work if we presented it to them in a way that um, made sense and was digestible. And I think part of that was taking those pots and kind of stripping them of some of their really kind of folk vernacular details that um, made them so specific to that thing. but. Uh, doing that in a way that we could retain the kind of foundational aspects of the work that we really found value in. I mean, an example being the kind of materiality of pots that are made with materials that are of a specific place. Uh, I think a lot of people's perception of dinnerware um, is, you know, your, your kind of archetypal mental image is like the whiteware, um, kind of glossy white plate. Um, but, to have to have a piece of pottery that kind of like speaks of the earth from which it came, uh, I think can be really meaningful. Um, so yeah, I think the process of designing the mug in particular was taking the experience of making a bunch of mugs in this particular tradition and trying to like maybe distill it down to a more essential kind of platonic ideal of that thing. Um, and there's a great video that Connie, I think you found a long time ago, of like Alex and I talking about mug designs way back in the day and actually drawing out the mug that like looks pretty much like the one that we make now. Um, so that might be a fun one to like share around after this. But yeah, I think it was just kind of a, Alex and I had a very shared, a clear shared language about how to make pots and could iterate ideas pretty quickly um, because of our shared training. And I think that's something of a shared vision for where it was going. And through that back and forth process, we got to, the place we're at now. And I think the other layer there was the design had to evolve further with uh, the technical shift of making pots by hand to making pots with machines. And I think the other layer that maybe we've got time to speak to is the kind of the color design aspect that came in um, once we switched to firing in gas kilns, uh, giving us more ability to like really be conscious color designers. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, technically, the mug we um, through the whole process of of switching to firing work in a gas kiln and making work that would hopefully speak to a broader audience, 
we started to simplify things. So we would retain the formal qualities that we felt were really like the core essence of a piece. So if you're thinking about a plate, it's, you know, the specific volume and curve that that plate has and the sense of containment by how much it scoops up and the fullness of the rim of that plate. Um, and with the mug, it was something similar, although the mug was a more drastic departure because it really, I mean, it has sort of dead straight walls down to a very um, sort of gentle curved base. Um, and the piece that was almost the hardest to design was the handle, which um, the types of handles that we were trained to make uh, would be pulled on, on a mug. So you would take a, um, a stock of clay, if you're a potter, you, you know this, you would take, we would take a small stock of clay and we'd smush it on and then pull it straight down and then put it on. And it had to retain a freshness and a feeling of not being fussed over. Um, a lot of, uh, there was a sort of decisiveness to it that only came through making a lot of them and really all the pots if they were good pots they contained that um that feeling uh so we wanted to what, what i was just here? thinking about like i mean it when you hear alex and john talk about pottery they and they're both like you know business guys now but like they also the second you start asking them like for to describe the pots that we make they just start talking in like haiku or haiku or like or extended metaphors that like and it's just like that's just the only way that there yeah, is to, uh, to speak pottery yeah. and it's hilarious yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the like Marx used to say that that a dinner plate should have the fullness of the moon sort of whatever <laughs> that means of course the moon is round, and a dinner <laughs> plate is round but that's not the same as the fullness of the moon he also used to go around and and would um a uh, really like a horrible insult would be to say that the pots didn't have any bones, no bones. Like they were all just sort of flab and flesh, but they didn't have a, a skeleton, a skeletal structure underneath. Um, I think John, you had a similar kind of experience with, because we- Yeah, I was thinking like, it's, I don't know if this is the right venue, but we wrote like an introductory preamble to our quality control document that is very much about this, like it's the, I don't know, and I was looking at it, there's a couple paragraphs I could read, but maybe that's like too much, but it's basically getting into this, this question. I don't know. Y'all think that's cheesy? Um, well, we could do a poll if you want to read it out. <laughs> so anyways, the mug, the handle, we, we wanted to retain the feeling of, a, of the handle. What, what, what was it about that handle that made it comfortable? Um, and at the same time, it's smooth and it is, it's not like every element of it is designed essentially for a purpose. It, it extends out like this when it hits the mug and that creates a space for your hands to rest. It's curved on the inside and there was many iterations. I mean, the mug took over a year to design. We changed how we formed it. Um, we found these sort of antiquated machines in England to make this vertical sidewall in a mold. So, is very, very complicated and it, nothing about, especially the handle is easy from a production standpoint. Um, yeah. We'll have a, we'll have an hour long mug chat sometime in the future too. Yeah. Make mug poetry. Uh, do you want to talk about, do you want to move on to that question or should we skip that one? No, we can. Okay, go yeah. for it. I'll try to be quick because I just yammered on about the mug. Um, Caitlin asks, how you acquire the upfront capital required to start a business when you don't have a whole lot saved up. Um, so there's multiple ways to do it either. Um, and it depends on how fast you want to go. Um, pottery in particular is very expensive, especially when um, John Warren hit us up, John, <laughs> we'll chat later. Uh, um, the upfront capital is, it, it has to be there. It either has to come uh, through investors or through family or through savings to do certain things, especially if you don't have a track record uh, and if you're not bankable. Uh, we were certainly not bankable. So the initial iteration of East Fork I started 
with family money. Um, that's how it all got started. I built the wood kiln, bought some property, uh, and was fortunate enough to meet John and Connie. Otherwise, I'd still be out there um, <laughs> making pots alone. It would be very sad. Um, so that's just, I like to be very honest and upfront about that. Um, that was the very first iteration of it. Uh, but then when we realized that East Fork needed to change and shift, we needed more money. Uh, and at that point, pretty much all of the money had gone into just starting up that initial part of it. Um, so we were approached by a customer who said, um, you know, what do you guys think about uh, taking an investor? And unbeknownst to, to this person, we had been talking about this and hatching this plan. And I think that that first investor who approached us was thinking that they'd loan us, you know, 20 grand or 30 grand to buy some, a kiln or something. Uh, and we had this much larger vision that we had started to, um, to, to bring together. Um, so we did what's called a family and friends round, um, which doesn't include any institutional capital or venture capitalists. Um, and it was people that loved what we were doing. They saw the passion in what we were doing. They saw, uh, that it was a good, we were creating something of value. Um, and we were very fortunate. And again, you know, all of these, all of these conversations do, um, they come back to class and they come back to privilege and they come back to all of these things that we were in a, a position to, to know people that, you know, could, could have these conversations to, um, I was in the position to start this thing and not have debt piled up. So um, all of that uh, for me, you know, I, for a long time, I kind of struggled with the, the guilt of that. And as Eastwork has grown much larger than just say me doing the thing that I was doing uh, now Eastwork, you know, it, how do I, how do I describe this? Um, there's a lot of people, involved in what we're doing right now there's a lot of good that's going into the world and it's completely eclipsed like especially alex matisse and my family name and people used to come out interested in the pots that i made and a lot of it had to do with the family name um and now the uh, the majority of people that buy our pots have no idea and east fork's taking this whole so i'm i'm kind of rambling off off subject now but um yeah, I hope that that answers the question. And then if you, there are other ways to do it too. If you want to go fast and do something big, you have to have a relatively big vision. And the vision that we have is big, but it's not big enough for certain types of investment like venture capital, uh, which is either you go, you know, huge, we're, we're in this kind of a middle ground, I think. But um, on a much smaller scale, there are funding options for securing things like equipment um, through, like in Asheville, we have Mountain BizWorks. So there are funding options that are that specialize um, in either through grant funding or, or through traditional debt instruments um, in making small loans available to people to do things. Um, yeah, John, do you have anything to add to that? I think that, I mean, bring it back to like the original question and then just like my own experience talking to, to friends who are um, grown businesses as well. Like, I think that's an important takeaway that we were like, just like Alex said, we were uniquely privileged to be able to pursue the thing that we're doing and that the reality of it is there's a lot of barriers to entry to, to growing a business and like capitals uh, really difficult to come by. Like banks won't lend you money if, unless you're a profitable business. Um, it's hard to find investors unless you've got a really compelling vision and something of a, you, you know, you've got to convince people to give you your money, their money and, and risk it on you. And there's just like a lot of, a lot of barriers to, to doing that. And that felt like early on, like we kind of had discussions around like, um, yeah, facing that, that opportunity and, and actually taking advantage of that privilege and trying to do something meaningful with it instead of kind of shrinking from the discomfort. Um, but yeah, it's, 
we got a few questions about like how do you start a business and secure financing and i think the reality of it is it's very very difficult <laughs> um yeah and even with when you look at these big companies that are venture backed you know the founders of a lot of these companies went to business school they have a network they come from wealth not all of them but most probably do um and most of them are white you know and have a circle that makes it just so much easier to suddenly go and raise a few million dollars and then more and more and more and, and go um so and the other side is to grow slowly um and organically um and be profitable uh, but with our business in particular uh, ceramics is a lot of fixed costs a lot of big equipment if you want to start doing it on a higher production and if you're making it by hand um, it's really hard to do it and 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 get comfortable um, as, as as I'm sure most of you know um, if there are potters watching this An expensive little yeah don't 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 try to scale your pottery manufacturing company if what you're hoping to do is turn a quick profit. It's not going to happen. Um, okay, what else, guys? There's, we only have like 20 minutes left. So how do you cultivate your social media? Persona? All right, I'll talk about this. Josephine asked, "How do I cultivate cultivate my social media persona? Um, how do I decide which parts of my heart to share?" and what standard, standards or stances to publicly take. Um, she also mentions that uh, she ran into me at the YMC bathroom back before quarantine and was the most awkward person of all, and I'm sorry for that. I distinctly I remember, remember that, because um, I was uh, trying to go to uh, a soul powered dance class and was already feeling extremely uncomfortable because uh, it was kind of like out of my comfort zone. Uh, but after the dance class, I was like much more open and recept receptive to the thought of um, meeting meeting strangers in the bathroom. So, um, hi, Josephine. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I would consider myself a, I don't know. I, this question get, buckles me up every single time because I, I, I don't really think about, like I don't have like a vision in my head of like the person that I want to, um, to cultivate um, necessarily. Um, yeah, this question gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, the, I think that what I do want to say that's in, that's in relation to this question is that a lot of advice I hear, a lot, I hear a lot of people giving other people advice that if you want to cultivate an Instagram persona, you should just be your authentic self. Like that this idea of just like showing up as your authentic self. Um, and I want to uh, make it very clear that, um, that there is a serious difference between um, your, your human person, um, the person that you, how you show up in, in the relationships, in relationships that are actually um, in the real world and the ones that matter, um, the ones that are offline and the person that you are online. And so it can be really frustrating for me to feel, especially in a small town like Asheville, there's a lot of people who feel like they intimately know me um, when we've never met before. Um, and I, through that process, which is, it can be pretty awkward, through that process I've, I've learned to put um, stronger boundaries between myself and my personal identity and, um, and my, my internet persona. Um, because if you don't put those boundaries and you do decide that you want to be a person who takes very strong stances, um, you, you have to recognize that you're opening yourself to, um, to scrutiny from um, potentially hundreds of thousands of strangers. Um, and if you um, leave room, leave cracks um, open for, um, for the, the you know, feelings of strangers who don't actually know you, um, or know you out of context um, to, to creep in and start affecting um, your, your vision of yourself, things obviously get really nasty. So I have gone through my fair share of that for sure. Um, and I think finally in the last six months, um, I, I've worked a lot on my own personal resiliency and have been able to put up some, some stronger barriers. Um, so yeah, I don't know, all that to say that if you are trying to, to I don't know, like hone your person, your social media persona and someone has given you the advice of just being yourself. Um, think twice about that. I think that, um, that not, that the, 
you kind of centering yourself in the story of your business is not the only way to have um, to make an impact with social media marketing. Um, you kind of have to to be really honest with yourself if it's not only something that you want to do, but something that you're good at. Um, not everybody is really like some people are really, really funny in real life, but then they it just doesn't translate well. Like some humor doesn't translate well to the Internet. Like it is it should not be ever be an unfiltered experience like i can make a joke to alex because we've known each other for 11 years and it can land a certain way but when you're making a joke on instagram you have to remember that you have 140,000 people who have no idea who you are or what you what you actually think about the world like they, there's no context for anything um and so you have to be really thoughtful about the words you put out there um which while you're trying to be an authentic person um can be really really hard so I, I would not give the advice of um, just, just Instagram is not, or Instagram for a business should not be a live journal. Um, it is a, it is still a very much, um, it should be a, a thoughtful representation of, of who you are, um, even when you are being off the cuff and goofy and real and authentic. Um, hopefully that kind of answered that question. Because words can hurt people. John, do you, um, do you have a question you want to? Into. Um, yeah, there's one here about um, our supply chain that kind of plugs into the B Corp stuff. I could I could speak to that. Yeah. Um, so Jane was asking, what are you doing to be sure that your supply chain is in line with company values? And that's uh, one of the examples of the work that the B Corp certification really asks of companies. And, and for me personally, has been a really uh, both frustrating and eye opening um frontier to be exploring um broadly speaking a b corp certification there's this nonprofit that's basically um collected sort of best practices and metrics that businesses can use to um if you're a business who is saying you want to be a tool for social good then b corp has kind of created this toolkit and and ways to measure progress that actually makes companies kind of walk the talk um and so we're in the process of, of doing that certification. And one of the areas that they ask you to look at is uh, your supply chain, or more broadly speaking, um, the jargon would be like your value network, um, which is a bit more comprehensive. Not only um, all the different vendors and places and communities that your raw materials are coming from, but then also um, all the resources required to get the thing out into the world uh, and the communities that the end up being the, the end user and considering all of that so um we're kind of just starting this work and there's a lot to it but i think one example through the lens of our carbon planning that i think gives you an example of, of the value of the work is um we're trying to quantify the carbon emissions not just uh out of our chimneys on our kilns um but also out of the, the power plant from which we get our electricity. Um, and also um, all the carbon emissions embodied in the delivery trucks and the UPS vans that are um, taking our pots to where they're going. Uh, the mining operation in spruce pine that's extracting the feldspar that we're putting into our clay. Um, you very quickly when you start trying to look at your whole supply chain, your whole value network, it gets expansive really fast. Um, uh oh, am I frozen? Like people driving to. The people, the people driving to uh, work for you, too. So that's, yeah, that's a good, that was the example I was going to give. So one thing, one big eye-opener for me was, you know, we've, we've quantified the carbon emissions coming out of our, our the, the chimneys on our kilns, which intuitively seems like this, this big source of pollution, of fossil fuel consumption. Um, you know, we're firing these big industrial kilns, basically, uh, every day, like Alex said, and our best estimates right now are every month there's about 20 metric tons of CO2 coming out of those chimneys, which sounds like a lot and feels like a lot, um, and it is a lot. But contextually, when we dove into kind of our, our value network and our supply chain, we analyzed, we tried to estimate what's the carbon footprint of um, our employees' annual driving habits, in particular commuting to and from work. Um, and it actually appears, you know, the, the amount of CO2 that's coming out of our kilns um, annually is equivalent to about uh, 40 people driving for a year. Um, and we have 80 employees. So kind of by those numbers, 
if we were really serious about reducing our emissions as a group of humans, focusing on like ride sharing and uh, using the buses uh, would actually be a more effective way to kind of bring about immediate change as opposed to trying to reinvent um, kiln technology of, of how we fire our work, which is also kind of an aspiration of ours. But um, that was an example for me where it was like, oh, wow, like that's, that goes against my intuitive understanding of things. Um, similarly, like our supply chain with our clay, the clay comes from probably a hundred, hundred mile square radius, a hundred mile radius uh, from here. And it's everything from a small family owned farm where there's clay that's excavated with a backhoe just by two dudes who have on the land to a ginormous feldspar mine up in spruce pine that is owned by a multinational mining corp that they've drilled a thousand foot hole into the side of a mountain um, and drive around those big trucks that you know probably burn a gallon of diesel every 12 feet that they, they move. Um, and just getting, even just getting a sense of what our supply chain entails is a lot of work, let alone starting the conversations with our vendors about how can we work to actually bring about the change that we wanna see. So that's sort of a rambly answer, but I think it's, to me, the, the takeaways that we're, we're getting started on it and it's, that's a really exciting frontier for me as opposed to, um, it's just kind of expanded my understanding of what aspect of the world we're interacting with, you know, and what we're responsible for. And um, yeah, so that's my supply chain spiel. John? Yeah. Um, well, we are almost out of time. I want to end with Julia's question, um, which I could probably talk about for three hours, but I'm going to try to talk about it in five minutes. Because um, I think it's a, it's it's where my brain has been living a lot um, the last several months um, and, and before that, but especially now. Um, and this is the question. There are a lot of people who argue that the internal scandal slash reckoning we've been seeing more of, Everlay in the wing, et cetera, is not surprising because believing that a business preaches what it sells is utopic and a bit naive. So should we not be so appalled or surprised when internally the company doesn't live up to their preached brand values? What do you think about that? I have a lot, I think a lot of, I think about it a lot. Um, so, um, oh man, this, I had this answer so, so carefully formed and then I got really nervous that I wasn't gonna be able to do it justice in the next five minutes and, and now I'm freaking out. Um, yeah, I think that it is, it, abuse of power, is not surprising, right? Like abuse of power uh, comes at no surprise. Um, it, um, it has been, it's, it's how uh, humans have been doing business um, for centuries now. Um, if someone has, a pow has power um, and they feel like there is a, a struggle for shared resources, um, it's likely that they're gonna abuse it. Um, that said, um, I'm finding I'm finding that um, companies that do say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna lead with our values. We're we care about X, Y, and Z. We're gonna hold ourselves accountable." Um, those companies, of course, tend to be the ones that become more heavily scrutinized, get put under the put on under the microscope more than companies who are like, "Yeah, I don't I don't give a shit about values. I'm I'm here for the bottom line. Um, I'm gonna." going to do the thing that my business class told me to um, in order to make the make everything stay in the black and um, be able to pay myself well. Um, and so what I've seen a lot is that there are a lot of companies who have who the second they come under scrutiny, um, there's this like retreating that happens. They're like, oh shit, like cover is blown. Everyone's found out about us. Like it's it's time to just like tuck our tails under our um, what is I don't even know the, how that phrase goes tuck our tails between our legs and and run away. Um, and I think that that's where, that's where there's a lot of work to be done. And, and um, you know, East, East Fork, we, as we talked about, we've made it very, like we've been, we've been talking about white supremacy since 2016. We've been making all of these, we know how to use the language. We've been making very grand claims about the type of business that we want to be. Um, and we also are, um, have our eyes extremely wide open to um, just how much work we still have to do, um, just how um, how far we still have to go. Um, 
And we're willing to sit with that and acknowledge that and say, yeah, like there's, there's a, a vision for, for what this world can look like. And, um, and we're working toward that and we're not there yet. Um, and I think the thing that a lot of companies like The Wing and, and Everlane maybe could have, could have done differently um, was to, to, to have um, a system of, um, of trusted, um, trusted uh, colleagues or some, some system of being able to hold themselves accountable so that when they went to sleep at night, there was no question of, of did I make the right decision in this moment? Um, there's this, there's a, a need to, um, to and, that, and that took us a long time to figure out, like we were, we were just kind of shouting at each other and, and making decisions that we thought were the right ones, but not really taking time to, to turn around and, and ask a, a larger group of people, hey, what do, you, what do you think about this decision that we made? How could we have done it differently? Um, and so the last year we've spent um, a lot of time kind of um, figuring out who our trusted advisors are, who are, who are the community members that are gonna help hold us accountable when there's a moment where we have made a mistake and we have to, um, to publicly acknowledge the harm that we've done um, and, um, and ask, ask the person that we've harmed or ask the, the group that we've harmed, how can we rectify this harm? What do you need to make this feel better? Um, had we now we have had that practice and there's we have that internal script of okay when we make a mistake what does it look like to to rectify and then get back in right relationship with the people that we're doing business with so i, I think that there is a way to be a values aligned business um so long and and to to lean into that um so long as you have that system of accountability put in place um and i also want to um to acknowledge that there are like 99% of the businesses who aren't bothering um, with stating their values publicly at all um, are just getting away with doing the same old shit that they've always done um, while people who are trying are, um, are getting, um, you know, torn into pieces and, and canceled. So um, while I, I do think that there is a, a time and a place for, um, for canceling someone, um, I, I think that we should all challenge ourselves to really figure out, um, am, I, am I publicly criticizing? Am I making an opinion be out of a place of, um, of, of misplaced anger? Or do I have a full picture here? Um, do, I, do I know enough about the situation in order to make a, um, an educated um, decision? Or am I participating in cancel culture because it's, it's really easy and convenient and it's a, a good outlet for my frustration? Um, Adrian Ray Brown talks about this really beautifully. Um, and I, all, I encourage all of us to, um, to sit with the, the words that she's been putting out there um, in regards to this question. But thank you, Julia, um, for asking that question. I think it's a really important one for us to all be chewing on right now. Um, also, oh, go ahead. Well, I just, I also have some thoughts What's on that. It's what? It's five, but just, you can is that, just say is that problematic? Well, it's end. We're supposed to end. Then you can people leave. can leave. If yeah, can people leave. can leave. Y'all can leave. We'll, we'll record you this later. Leave. We don't want to. I'm going to keep talking. Hold you hostage. Yeah. All these companies, especially the ones mentioned here and other companies, I think, um, they've all raised a huge amount of money. They're led by relatively inexperienced founding teams, which we are as well, uh, and have a lot of young people working for them. They're growing incredibly fast. Um, and there's a lot of public you know, eyes on them. And people can sniff out if if what, which came first, if you wanted to start a business to then sell it uh, or IPO, and then your values end up being your marketing strategy, uh, people smell that. And eventually they'll start calling you out for it. If you started a business because you, in our case, just were obsessed with making pottery for some bizarre reason, and then it got really fun to bring more and more people together and involved in that, uh, that will flow through. And there's a lot of companies that quietly or not so quietly just keep doing the thing. Um, big companies, Patagonia, Ben & Cherry's, like who have done a really good job of, of really living that stuff. And I didn't really understand what living your values meant until I think this year, probably, um, when suddenly things were being tested. Um, so I was really fortunate. I think we all were fortunate to have those values defined 
and who have spent enough time in, in defining them that they really were core um, to, to how we want to operate. And, and some of it's aspirational too, and, and also knowing that, yeah, we're going to mess up. We have messed up. We will mess up again. Um, but just showing up for those conversations when we do. So. Get back on the horse. Yeah. yeah. There's lots more great questions. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's because we're so long winded. Um, Barry Zipperstein, our green packing materials, it's called Giami. You can email us, we'll tell you all about it. Um, Barry Zipperstein makes great pots. Y'all yeah. should check out Barry Zipperstein's pottery. Yeah, lots of lots of ways to pack ceramics without bubble wrap and packing peanuts if you if you care to find out. Um, pretty easy. But good so. questions about calculating your cost of goods sold. We've actually been talking about the ones so much that and John made a, a beautiful slide presentation about how to um, calculate your cost of goods sold. So I think we need to get that on the blog so that we can always have that question to um, to be able to send around. Um, all right, that is our time for the day. Thank you so much. Well, you can't, you can't just keep talking. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. We're going to do this again. Maybe we'll do it more than quarterly because um, it is really, uh, it's just great to be able to, I wish that we could see your faces, um, but then things get confusing and weird for everyone. Um, but thank you. And um, we hope you will um, come again. I'll keep talking. I mean, we can keep talking, I guess, but I got to go home too at some point now. <laughs> we can keep talking. You want to talk? Yeah, I mean, I really love this question that Kate asked um, called about how do you deal with producing a product that has finite endpoint for purchasing. Um, wait, is that the one? No, that's not the one. That's, I mean, this is also a great question. Um, we had a lot of questions about making new things and when we're going to make new things. Uh, we will make new things. We're sort of, we very slowly are uh, rolling out the new objects and the pieces of pottery, but we can't make enough of the things that we currently have. So that's really the main thing that slows us down. If we had a huge amount of capacity, uh, we could start to introduce new items. Another one, another question that is great. So I'm not positive just because get, we're getting so many, I've gotten so many DMs with people who are, who are saying, why do you keep using these scarcity mindsets? You're exploiting me because I am not able to get, get the thing that I want to get. And this is exploitive to use scare. I, guys, I don't, what do you, I mean, you, we, you, this is the thing is that like Julia's question about how do you, how do you actually live into your values? We are not going to hire, um, we're not going to, to force our overworked, um, you know, workforce to work even more at lower pay so that we can make more pottery uh, so that we can, I mean, this is like, there, there are, you, you can't have it all. And that's the thing, like when, um, well, we will when this kiln slams. One day we can, we're we're working on a way to have it all, but um, right now we don't. There's there's no option to be able to make more pottery um, unless we were to slash um, our production team's wages in half and hire twice as many people and work them around the clock. No, no, that's and not true. That we. That's <laughs> not true. At this moment, <laughs> at this moment, we cannot make pottery because we don't have the kilns to fire yeah. the pottery. Yeah. We could make more pottery and we will make more pottery and we are making more pottery without having to do that. But first we, can we make, need, we can we make need the money pottery. to buy the kilns and that's, it's just. No, no the kilns have been bought. Like this. You're trying to overcomplicate the point that I'm trying to make, which is just that if we could make Sorry. more pottery right now. We would. We yes. would. Yes. <laughs> yes. But we can't. So that's the end of the story. Yeah. Yeah. But one day we're going to have more pottery, but by that time there's going to be more people who want to buy it. So. Yeah. Maybe the next time. I won't we go won't, into this. Worry, I, won't, <laughs> I won't go into this now, but uh, there was a question around making pottery that was more accessible from a price point of view, because our pottery is expensive, um, and we know that. And I think that that would be a great a great thing to discuss because that's certainly something that we talk about as we look at new equipment. A lot of it, you know, a lot of how pottery is sold at the price it is, is because uh, it doesn't require a whole lot of people to make it, either through automation or it's made in a place where the standard wage is um, very, very low. Uh, like in Southeast Asia, uh, Bangladesh, which has one of the lowest um, hourly wages. So 
So that's the, those are the things that you have to think about. And we're looking at automation and we're looking at all of these things. Um, but again, uh, it does have to make its way into and through um, our, that conversation around values. So um, anyways, okay, I'll be done. John, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, I guess I don't. I mean, that's, we've covered some ground. We can get to all of it. I think, yeah, I would love to like talk more about, I, I never know like the right balance to strike between getting into the nitty gritty numbers and dollars and cents. Um, Cause that's the world I live in and think in, um, but not like, I don't know. Yeah. Overcomplicating it or whatnot, but I mean, things like the, what it costs to make what we do and um, where we're trying to get that to and the driving factors there and how much money we've had to raise to do this thing and painting it in more realistic pictures. I'd love to like keep that conversation going with people. And that was kind of part of the original idea of like a kind of community um, quarterly investor call sort of thing of, of just giving people a sense of the, the guts of it. You know, I like that. So I would love to pick that theme up next, next quarter. We can do it. We can do whatever we want. We own the company. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to remember. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much. This we really fun. appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you.